Oh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to a belated edition of the Weekend Wrap brought to you by Crowcast. Uh, obviously, a bit later this evening because of the uh, stupid, stupid Twilight fixture. I can't stand Sunday Twilight. And also because I happen to fall asleep after the game. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, joining me tonight uh, are my usual cohorts. Uh, Nikki, how you going, Nick? I'm here. Very good. Little croaky. Little croaky. Well, uh, yeah. Um, and Maka, how you going, mate? Uh, no, very good. Very pleased to be uh, talking to you after a win rather than a loss. Oh, yeah. It makes a change, doesn't it? A pleasant change. God, does it ever. Well, look, uh, interesting round of footy all around uh, so far. So um, why don't we get into it and uh, look at the scores so far. And, of course, a good evening to everyone on the chat listening in on Spreaker and also those of you who are joining us on Facebook. Thanks very much for that. Um, And, of course, thanks to all our patrons uh, for supporting us. Uh, Without you guys, we wouldn't be as (laughs) disorganised. We wouldn't be be here. So uh, thanks very much for that. Look, it all started on uh, Thursday night when Collingwood probably... More more comfortably than I expected, uh, guys got up over Brisbane one twenty three to sixty one. Yeah, look, I think what we saw that was that Collingwood. We know they're the real deal, uh, and the Brisbane Lions were hoping they were the real deal, and Collingwood just showed them they've got a little ways to go yet. Yeah, it's probably a I fair haven't... call, mate. Yeah, you guys just talk about them because the only game I've actually seen this round is ours. Okay. <laughs> I've, been stuck, I've been stuck in the convention center for two days. That's pretty <laughs> so funny. When, when I got home, I was I was like you've been falling straight asleep. So <laughs> you two can carry this bit, this part without. All right. Uh, so it's the scores roundup with Macca and Phoenix. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, look, I, I didn't. I, Brisbane just seemed to have tailed off the last couple of weeks, and, and I didn't think that they'd uh, they'd go down without a yelp, basically, uh, Mac. No, I, I thought they'd probably put up a better showing than they did. They had everything in their favour. They had a it was a home ground game. They had a very very good crowd, uh, giving them plenty of support. But um, no, look, the, the Collingwood uh, look, they start to the ruck, the midfield, and after that. Um, yeah, that, you're just chasing tail after that, and I mm. think Collingwood far too good. Yeah, it's certainly uh, one of the form uh, sides early in the season. Anyway, uh, look, Friday night uh, or Friday afternoon, I should say, North and Essendon uh, just making our loss to North even worse. Essendon uh, getting it comfortably, one one six to fifty eight, a margin there of fifty eight points, and uh, North never looked in the hunt, and they they played. Like my son pointed this out to me, they play con- completely differently to what they did against us the previous week. Well, I think the opposition also played very differently to the way we played. Um, Essendon were all out of salt, um, and that's the way they play a little bit very gun and run and straight at you. And, uh, and if you're not up to it, they'll get past you. And uh, uh, whereas we were sort of hedging our bets and trying to get around them and uh, making mistakes, wrong choices, etc. And as you say, it really does make our loss of North Melbourne look even worse than it Ugh. really what it really was. It was unbearable as it was, but then to think that they go out there and get their bums absolutely t- uh, came by mm-hmm. Essendon, um, <laughs> who really all they did was just just run them off their legs and um, made them look very, 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 very ordinary indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, and then later on. Uh... Just to just to make matters worse, Port get up over the over the Eagles over there uh, at Optus Stadium. Port getting up ninety five to fifty three after a, a fast start, and uh, West Coast never looked in it, and uh, they kind of looked a bit disinterested. I reckon West Coast after a half time. Well, I think the Port uh, had a, had a plan, and uh, and it worked to a T. In they weren't they weren't going to ever bomb the ball long into their forward lines. Uh, 
couple of times they forced it, but in the majority of cases, they kept the ball very low coming into their forward line. Because if you look at what the, the West Coast have got back there, uh, with Hearn, uh, Barras and McGovern, uh, who are all excellent overhead marks, etc., uh, putting the ball in at ground level, etc., or, or on chest level, mm. um, I thought Port, Port had a plan for the game, which they did. And, uh, and I thought they executed it very, very well and played. I think they showed if you want to beat West Coast, ha- how to beat West Coast. And uh, it's whether other teams can actually re- replicate what they did. But they were very, very good. Yeah. I, look, I, I actually, I'm, I'm going to put that loss down to early season form crap. But I don't think it actually proves anything. Mac, to be honest, I reckon um, I certainly thought Port played well, and I reckon um, I, I, it's the first time I've really sat down and watched Port play, and they're really benefiting from having Lysette, in my opinion, because it it, it massive it, it, it massive. frees them up in terms of how they use their tools now. Um, so um, I and and but apart from that, they just run and gun uh, a bit like Essendon, and uh, sometimes very similar, off, yeah. Sometimes that'll come off and sometimes it won't. So we'll, we'll see how it plans out. But uh, West Coast has been up for a while, and, uh, you know, and they're probably just chugging along at the moment. So I wouldn't put too much store on it. Hey, uh, on Saturday, um, just the, the hits keep coming on because Frio decided they'd go to Canberra and hand out a 24-point defeat to GWS, if you don't mind, 106-82. to 82. If you told me that was going to happen, I wouldn't have believed you because <laughs> when you look at the quality of the players in respectively in each of the sides, with due respect to Frio, yeah. um, and, uh, and uh, even allowing for Fife to play very well, which he did, the quality of the midfield that GWS have is, is probably second to nobody. And actually their midfield played well. Um, it's just that they got beaten in so many other areas around the ground. And... Uh, uh, Absolutely staggered me, uh, and put, you know, take our hats off. They went, Frio went there, and uh, they played a lot uh, freer than they normally do. Fiend. you know, normally they're very dour, etc. But I mean, they scored 106 points, so they've actually played a, a reasonably open brand of footy. And um, they, yeah, you know, some of the players that they've imported played well, and uh, they, they they were too good. It, it's funny sometimes. Sometimes I watch Frio, and I think, did you guys leave Ross Lyon at home? Because <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair comment. They because they just a Ross Lyon type of footy. Every now and again, they just pull out a game like that where they they score quite freely and it, and it's quite open. And you think, well, hang on a minute, That's you're actually are you guys getting told off for not following a game plan or something? Because it's so unfree mantle like. So, but they they certainly uh, GWS looked a bit impotent um, in terms of their their ability to score. Um, so. Cameron, I think was Cameron injured, well, or did he? Did he just have a bad game? He'd been carrying an arm. He'd been carrying his left arm. He's been, um, I think he's got, got trouble with his shoulder joint, but he's been so, sort of. Yeah. He's yeah, been okay. uh, soldiering on with it, but uh, and they've been relying so heavily on him as well. Yeah, but yeah, uh, and he didn't have a lot of support, and uh, they just didn't score it up, and Freo did. He heard it about three weeks ago. Yes. And then for those three games, you actually look, look at him when he runs. He moves one arm, but that arm just, he just has it hanging straight down. And so it even holds it, Nikki. Yeah. It's not good, but I don't think they can afford to not have him in the side. Hmm. So that might come and bite them in the bum. Well, they're going to have to make a call because like, they could just about do him in if he, if he hurts it anymore. Yeah, true. Um, sorry, I was just uh, answering Paul on Facebook. He was saying uh, who's going to play Miller's role, and I, I will, obviously we'll talk about that later. Oh. But I was answering. Uh, it can't be D Mac because he's already in. Um, so no, D Mac. D Mac's on the wing. Shh, Nikki, it was a joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, later, later on Saturday afternoon, uh, just Melbourne. Are they going to actually win a game this year uh, after the weekend? I don't know. I know they've won Look, one If they already. play like they did on the weekend, they won't win a game. Because, they won't um, win another game. There were some very good individual performances for them in terms of Max Gorn. Um, uh, Brayshaw wasn't too bad. There was a couple, uh, a couple of other blokes that uh, had reasonably good games. But, gee, they've got a lot of players that are really out of form at the moment. And uh, 
their back line looks very easy to penetrate at the moment. Uh, they've got a couple, two or three that are injured out of the back lines and, uh, uh, well, they, they, they're not looking at a shadow of the side that they were last year and um, I'm not sure they will come good eventually, but, you know, they're going to lose a lot of games before they do. Wow. On the, yeah. on the other hand, St Kilda, you know, he, uh, talking about the, co he's the coach of St Kilda yeah. being the first one to get the chop, but um, look, they, they're, they're just a mob of honest goers at the moment. They, oh. they are having a red hot go. Two comments, are they? Mac. Uh, one is uh, the reason why St Kilda are at the top of the table at the moment, they spent money on a coach, Brett Ratton. Uh, hasn't he made a difference there? And Nicky um, would I'm saying exactly that before the game. Yeah, before we before the show, yeah. Amazing how much more organised they look, um, and I'm sure it's no coincidence. I know that Richardson's had a couple of years there to bed in his systems and stuff, but I don't think it's a coincidence that they look more organised and and uh, Ratton happens to be on the scene. And the second is um, uh, Cam. I didn't watch the game. Cam was telling me that Melbourne Melbourne are a bit like us in terms of their midfield. They're not running defensively apparently, and. Uh, Certainly the little bits and pieces I've seen of them this year, they've looked slow. So they're in a bit of struggle. Well, they now. have been slow and they have been lazy. Yeah, no yeah. doubt about that. So, And if you, you know, if your midfield don't run backwards, well, you, you get cool. Yeah, well, that's right. Well, we've, we've seen that ourselves. Um, later on Saturday evening, uh, Richmond uh, on a good little patch of form, uh, getting up over uh, Sydney, who are just going at the moment. Uh, Richmond 89 to Sydney 67. Didn't watch the game, unfortunately. Uh, I saw it. Um, not a great game, but, you know, I thought Richmond, uh, they probably played up to their expectations and Sydney probably played up to theirs and the result was as most people thought it would be. Yeah. Um, Sydney are only just travelling at the moment and uh, they've, got, they've got quite a few young blokes in there, but... Uh, some of their more experienced blokes are, are not giving them a lot either. Um, that Sydney, we said, there's not a chance in the world that Sydney will be in the finals, and uh, they, I think there's every chance that they might even finish in the bottom, bottom six the way they're going. Yeah, I, th I think they're cooked this year, honestly. Um, if they are rebuilding, what are the chances they trade Buddy back to Hawthorne? Well, that's been a lot of talk about, you know, should they get rid of Buddy? Um, but the problem is, of course, is... Um, They're not allowed, the, even if they get rid of him, I think they still have to pay. Yeah, the problem is, that, that's it, Nicky, is that, that his contract is back-ended. So the big dollars are coming now. Oh, so, shit. And, and, I think, and I think it was actually written into his contract that if he retires or gets traded, etc., his salary still comes under their salary cap because he pissed them off by going to Sydney, not to GWS, which is where they, the AFL wanted him. So they made sure Sydney were going to pay. Nikki, I think you are right. Yeah, I, I seem to recall something about that too. So be interesting to see how that plays out because they've been up for a while, Sydney. They've, they're known as a, as a perennial uh, contenders, but I, I think uh, they just, <laughs> they're falling off a cliff at the moment. Um, speaking of falling off a cliff, my footy tips uh, continue to fall off a cliff after Carlton inexplicably got up over the Western <laughs> <laughs> What the fuck? There's their one Honestly. win for the year. There uh, we go. Carlton 101. They got their one. Yeah, Carlton 101 yeah. to the Bulldogs 57. It wasn't even close. Uh, the Bulldogs didn't give a yelp. And uh, the no, Blues no. seemed to be kicking him from everywhere. Um, so, yeah. I, I did see one clip and I've got a question. What the hell is Beveridge doing trying to make poor little Caleb Daniel play on whoever is the tallest forward? Yeah, well, I think Beveridge, I think he's got, he's got a question. There's a question about his sanity, quite frankly, because <laughs> uh, he took he took McRae out of the centre and when he was dominating in the first half and put him on a half forward flank for the rest of the game and took him out of the game, uh, which I think was another brilliant piece of coaching. Um, and You're he's just got shitty because he was in your dream team. I was pissed off about it. Um, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and and then on top of that, uh, Caleb Daniels, as Nicky quite rightly said, um, they've this one you can play him in the back line, sure, but you don't have to this poor little tacker, he comes I'm not very tall, he comes up to my navel and um, you know, he's trying to jump up with great big rock and all the rest of it. Uh, no, I think uh, Luke's not really thinking well at the moment. Yeah, well. You know, 
And, if, and I must say this about Carlton, and be, and let's be fair, they played good football. Um, and, you can, you know, and you, it depends who you play. I understand all the rest of it. But uh, every game they've played this year, they've had little patches where they have played some good football. And I thought today they played a lot of good patches of good football. Now, as I said, it's a lesser opponent and whether that will translate onto other games. But I'm a little bit fearful they might win more games. Oh, they might. I think they'll probably win four or five, Mac. Um, yeah, I think they will. They don't look terrible. And at the moment, they've got some stiff competition in Melbourne uh, as to whether they can finish on the bottom. Um, obviously, uh, one more game of the round coming uh, tomorrow, Hawthorne v Geelong at the MCG. That's at 3.20. But for now, that's it, uh, which leaves us with a... a uh, pretty much an almost complete ladder. We have the Saints on top with uh, four wins. Uh, the Cats yet to play on three. Uh, and then Dockers, Magpies, Port, Giants, Bombers, Eagles in the eight on three wins. And Lions, Tigers and the Suns out of the eight on three wins. The Suns were playing for top spot today and now they're in 11th. Uh, and the Crows on two wins, the Hawks yet to play also on two wins, Bulldogs on two wins, and then one win to Blues, Sydney, Melbourne, and Kangaroos. So uh, the ladder's not quite taking shape yet. Uh, it's, it's form is still it's very still hard to really catch. It's still really close. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Just very hard to Because ridiculously, catch we're one win from being second. Yeah, one win That's from bottom. That's how stupid it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, Precisely. we've... we've Five rounds in. I mean, it, more so, there doesn't seem to be any form trends at the moment. We've got some... So, I mean, I don't expect to see the, the Saints maintain a, a top four spot, for example. Um, I don't really expect the Bombers to stay in there. Um, and uh, you've got some quality teams like the Tigers um, uh, outside of the eight as well. So, yeah, I don't know. Funny old start to the season, though. It's all over the joint. I think Geelong are the one consistent team at the moment. Yeah, probably. All right, let's get into match talk. Wasn't it nice to see... I know it was only Gold Coast. I know it was only Gold Coast. But wasn't it nice... But Gold Coast aren't bad. No, well, I don't think they're bad. Uh, It was nice to see a little bit of that running carry going on again. Adelaide getting up comfortably over Gold Coast this afternoon. Um, in the end, 18 goals, 11, 1, 1, 9, 2 Gold Coast, 6 goals, 10, 46. Was at a margin of uh, 73 points in favour of Adelaide. Um, and most of that work was done in the first half. It was a quality uh, second quarter. And uh, then it was sort of uh, steady she goes after that. Yeah, the interesting thing is the... Uh, first quarter where I was starting to spare, I thought, here we go. It's all, it's one of these horrible games all over again. Um, something I didn't, did not pick up. Nicky said that, uh, the Gold Coast had how many, you reckon, Nicky? Two to three. Uh, uh, at t- no, at times, actually, I counted four extra defenders they would put in our forward line. Oh, yeah, they just, uh, most of time it, it was about three. They were massively, massively flooding, which is why we look so stagnant because we weren't going to kick it to that we were actually and the, the crowd was kind of funny because the typical thing of just kick it just kick it but it's like actually go look ahead of the football and see why we're not going to kick it um and they are also really trying to do a lot of lot of contested football um around uh, um sort of around the stoppages and things like that and trying to get the break because the only way they were scoring was they were trying to do the massive run um, and we set up very well to stop that. But then what that meant was they just that absolute flooding they would do. They couldn't contain it, though, um, and that's where it broke open in the second quarter. Well, I thought their first quarter was an arm wrestle, and um, really it was a question, as you say, Nikki, whether who could maintain that whatever they were doing and whatever pressure they were doing uh, for the longest. And, you know, after the quarter time break they, they couldn't continue doing what they were doing we could and uh and gradually we just got to hold ourselves into gear i thought our, our structure looked a lot better without jenkins there um 
we we could see that. Um, oh, you you mean a, a, another tall forward that actually leads away from where Walker wants to lead to? <laughs> well, I think that's where I was going to, Nikki. Yes, and uh, it was very nice to see that for a change. So, uh, and I think that started to open up our forward line, and uh, uh, and as a result of that, we looked so much better, and eventually they couldn't resist the, the pressure that we were putting on them. Yeah, the Gold Coast are pretty much a, a, a hard-working team. Um, yeah. when, it, when I was doing the, the preview show, it was apparent to me watching them against Carlton that they their midfield is, is just a really hard-working bunch and they, they uh, yeah. against Carlton, certainly they applied a lot of pressure and, um, you know, their, their forward pressure was really good against Carlton as well. They relied on repeat inside 50s. And it was always going to be a question in my mind of whether our midfield was actually going to shake off the uh, malaise that they were in and actually start working. And, and the most pleasing aspect for me uh, out of the game was just that all of a sudden we started to play with some energy. It was it was like the shackles had been released. Um, and we started to play with some energy. We, we applied our own frontal pressure. Um, a few blokes, Lockie Mur- Murphy, etc., uh, and having the the big bodies of Greenwood and and Ellis Yolman in that midfield, I think as well, really assisted in us not losing the ball out of stoppage and out of out of congestion too easily. Um, but and let's let's one, be honest. One though, but let, let's I was be just going to say though. one adva- one advantage of our midfield there, Fane, is that when you've with Cam Ellis um, Yolman and Greenwood in there, they actually know where Rob taps. And most of the time when he's winning the taps, it, it was actually Cam who was getting the ball because they actually know how to work together. Um, and I and I think that actually showed quite nicely. Yeah. One thing that uh, I do want to temper the whole thing with is the fact that I don't think any other team in the comp is going to actually just roll out the red carpet down the corridor like Gold Coast <laughs> did at times. Just no. have a little guard of honour down the corridor with a red carpet <laughs> and some bugles we- playing and... And a nice we did little... work hard to create that. We didn't really. They they didn't. They actually didn't work anywhere near as hard as they did last week. Particularly after quarter time, uh, they they looked yep. a bit out of steam. Um, Gold Coast, uh, and that's they've travelled a bit. I pointed that out. I pointed that out on Tuesday. I think it might have just been in the chat though that they've done quite a bit of travelling. Yep. Um, and whilst that's great for gelling a young group together it's also very tiring. And my feeling for this game was, was we're getting the Suns at the right time. Yeah, well, certainly the first quarter showed what they're capable of. They, they kept it very tight. Um, uh, you know, they, they were in and under and they, they, they matched us around the contest and we weren't really able to get much flow going at all. Um, you could tell in the first quarter that we were up for the game, though. Uh, we looked more energetic um, and uh, more willing to provide uh, to provide pressure around the contest but the Suns were pretty much matching us but then in that second quarter um, a couple of things sort of fell our way and and we were able to break the game open a bit and uh, I think at that stage the wall came out and smacked the Suns in the face um, because I don't think they had it in them Um, so you know a couple of their key players I I don't think Wits played particularly well on O'Brien um, they've been getting a lot out of their half-back line um, and they didn't really get any rebound from their half-back line uh, this week. And they just looked a bit impotent up forward. Not that it went down there terribly much, but um, they didn't seem to have a, a lot going on up forward apart from Sexton, who really didn't have one of his better games anyway. No, I think you're quite right. I don't think They didn't have a lot up, up forward, but uh, I thought that one of the main differences is we had individuals who could go to another level above the contest. And, uh, for example, um, uh, the two that Nicky did mention, the two big body midfielders, they did a good job. But the other midfielders as well, uh, both the Crouch boys and uh, Roy, and uh, they just, and I must mention Smith, of course, uh, they, were, they were just a cut above the other players on the ground. And that's where I think we just had those type of players that could actually make the game, whereas um, I, I can't really think of anybody from Gold Coast who was doing the same for them. They, they were just more an even team uh, trying to trying to match a team that had the same calibre of ordinary players or normal players, but then a few above them. And 
And I just think the class just took over in the end. Yeah, the, you, I think you're right in terms of their midfield. Um, Mac probably, you know, there's one or two that they've got in there that uh, Fiorini is certainly an up-and-coming uh, player. Um, you know, but and he played okay. Yeah, the Swallow is just a, an honest worker. Murdoch's a, yep. an extra long player. Um, Warren Smith's an extra long player. You know, the cast off. Jack Martin running through there. He didn't really do much. So they really, you're right. They didn't have a lot um, of class running through there, and and as and it was okay against when they're all working together and and working hard. They they can force a lot of stoppage and just sort of you know. Just through sheer sheer willpower, get the ball forward and score. But um, you rightly point out we had a little bit more class than they'd probably come up against this year, and our players were actually decided to play, so uh, they found it a bit harder. And I, I think in the end, Gold Coast just just ran out of steam, to be honest. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think. Um not a lot of people won't, and Nicky was saying, I haven't been on big footy, but a lot of people, Nicky was saying a lot of people were um, having a crack at Gibbs's game. But I thought that Gibbs had a very balanced game in the back line. And, uh, well, let's not get into individuals just yet. Uh, no, America. but I was just going to say, yep. I was just going to say and the altered structure and enabled uh, Smith to be very clearly the man to use. Yeah. And, uh, and I thought that, that that structure that they made, that they put in there, Made it so clear that it was Smith, and Smith really it was really just well. I know yeah. he was six hundred and thirty-five meters, and that was halfway through the last yeah. quarter. I don't know what his final total was, but I thought that that worked out very well. Yeah. Well, let's look yeah. through some head-to-head like stats first, and uh, then we'll have a look at some individuals. So, um, kick to handball ratio um, was uh, one to one. Sorry, one point two. So. 248 kicks, 207 handball. So it um, looked to me like we were kicking it a lot more than that. But uh, one thing I did notice in the stats on Fox is we actually had a lot of long kicks. So I think they class long kicks as anything over 25 metres or 30 metres. Um, mm-hmm. And that's one thing that did stand out to me, that we were using that 30-metre uh, sort of diagonal pass on the switch um, quite often. Uh, and I, I like that ball movement. Uh, 106 to 94 marks. Um, they, as I said, they're a hard-working team. They out-tackled us 83 to 69, but 69's pretty respectable uh, considering the margin. Uh, Riley O'Brien did pretty pretty well in the ruck, 39 to 56 hitouts overall. Uh, Freeze were even. Um, clearances were even, 39 each. Uh, rebound 50s. They had a couple more, as you'd expect, um, because we had the ball. Pardon me, we had the ball in there more often. Uh, inside 50s, 59 to 41 our way. And uh, our disposals per scoring shot uh, was back close to respectable levels. So it's 15.69. Uh, we still want to see it around about the 12 or 13 if possible. Um, contested posies, we won comfortably, which was a good stat to win against uh, the hard-working Suns, 169 to 151. Um, we also had far more of the uncontested ball. We controlled the play um, pretty much all game, uh, 283 to 238. Our disposal efficiency was good after being horrid in the first quarter. Um, 72 in the end, 72.7. The Suns just under 70. Uh, we took... Oh, when was the last time you saw us win a contested mark count? 15 to 8, uh, 11 to 7 <laughs> marks. Know. 11 to 7 <laughs> marks inside us. 50. What the hell? That's not us. I, I saw that stat flash up on the screen at the game and I'm just like, Fiend's going to lose his shit. <laughs> well, it's nice to have, you know, it was nice to watch a, what looked like a normal football club. Um, we lost the centre, 8-16, uh, so there's still work to do there, but we won around the stoppage, 31-23. to And I don't feel like the centre clearances uh, were as lopsided as the stats um, show. Um I don't know what, what I have to have a look at that because uh, it didn't look that much. Um, but we had we controlled territory so much six thousand two hundred meters gained to four thousand nine hundred from the Suns. We just uh, basically controlled the ground. Uh, turnovers are relatively even, and tackles inside fifty as you'd expect. They won because the ball was in our fifty more uh, fourteen to eight. So I mean, not a huge amount to glean 
from those stats, except for the fact that we probably uh, we had a little bit more success aerially than we have done so far this season. And we and the forwards led at the ball a lot more than we've seen. Um, instead of being static in packs, uh, but they were in individual leaders, and uh, Walker was uh, the benefit of a few of those, and there were. Uh, and there were others, Eddie, uh, and others had their moments where they led at, at the ball, at the, at the ball with who, sorry, at the person who was kicking the ball, rather than just uh, standing there in a static position. Uh, I thought that was one of the best things I saw about our forward line for the day. Yeah, there was there was a lot more good movement happening, um, and also the kicks when when we could get that um, the run on the the play on. Um, it looked actually quite nice uh, moving up forward. We were putting it in better positions if it was out to a space um, for the most part, um, except for a certain Rory Atkins, who inexplicably seemed to have six tackles. I saw two of them and I saw him actually hit a bloke, which was like, um, somebody got a talking to. Um, but most of the time, uh, I think that forward line movement was working a lot better. And as I said earlier, the fact that Himmelberg knows how to actually lead his player away from Tex. Um, and and Tex also adjusted some of his running patterns with, with the way they were dropping back. Mm. Uh, so there was one, instead of leading at the ball carrier, he would come out and then lead across, which made it harder for them to try and intercept. Um, and so, and, and Fiend, you and I have talked about this before with text he's jumping he's yeah. not afraid to jump yeah, and I that's was, to me that, that's again, the nicest thing to see every now and again I, was, I still see him go up with that one hand sort of thing but uh he looked pretty powerful tonight um and i think he enjoyed having a bit of space in the forward lines to be honest i think you're right one of the benefits of of elliot in there apart from his obvious ability to take a mark was the fact that he understands that it's not always about him. So there's just as much value in a forward creating space by leading out uh, and and leading away to to create space behind him. So um, and I think that worked a few times. We saw that, but as I mentioned, um, it was lovely to see the ball movement. But uh, I don't think there's going to be too many more games this year where we get that that uh, that free passage <laughs> to Carl's. No, but but to me, what it does is it actually says to the players, "Look, you can do this. It's going to be a bit harder, so then we have to work harder. But we know that we can do it. You can use it as a, a step forward." Yeah, yeah no, I think Fiend's point is valid, though. Um, as the game went on, we, it got easier and easier for us, and because uh, you've got your confidence rises, and you do things that you were you could and would be doing in the first half, but. Um, also, I don't think we are going to get it quite as easy as that against. Certainly, we won't, we won't get it as easy as that against the good side. So, and they're the ones we want to be able to beat if we want to go anywhere for the year. So, I think I'm a bit on Fiend's side there. Yeah, I just, I mean, I don't want to be Debbie Downer because it was a great win and it was, it was so enjoyable to see us play. You know, the way we used to seeing the Crows play, and how we have expected them to play so far this season. Um, and I don't want to fall into the trap and, and say it was just Gold Coast, um, but they did look a bit cooked after, particularly after the the second half, of the second quarter, and um, there there wasn't a lot of defensive pressure going on there um, in transition. Once we were able to get the ball free, we were able to move it pretty much as at will. That said, um, uh, I, the there were a couple of really good standout performances. I thought David McKay was excellent uh, off wing yep. and half back in providing run. I thought Rat was also good, although a little bit wasteful uh, at times. And obviously when Smithers got off the chain in the second quarter, um, he was the real uh, catalyst for us getting on top in that second quarter. And I, I felt like those three um, were integral to us being able to move the ball the way that we did. I also, as much as Tommy Lynch had a stinker by foot, I actually... Oh, he first caught it. He bloody worked hard, <laughs> he, as yeah, always. He, he kept getting the ball. Uh, he kept presenting. And, I, I, you know, it wasn't his cleanest game by any stretch of the imagination, but I actually felt like 
But, and he actually seemed to be working even further up the ground. So whether there's been an adjustment there, I'm not sure. But he was almost working between wing and half back at some stages. Um, so that was good. But for me, for me, the key was the rebalance in the midfield. Um, at first, you'd think that having Greenwood, Ellis Yeoman, um, Matt Crouch, Brad Crouch, etc., in the mid midfield would like make us look slow. <coughs> But what it actually did, from my opinion, and Nick, you might have an uh, opinion on this, it actually helped us not lose the ball so easily out of the uh, out of the congestion. Yeah, and we were better at setting up um, to stop that um, when we get a little bit too sucked in to the contest. We were better at still having those outriders to then um, put the pressure on. Uh, a couple of times it didn't quite work and that's when they got a, a bit of their run. But the vast majority of um, those um, contested situations, it, it was a lot better structure um, from what we're doing and not too many of them going in. They would then drop out just that little bit to, to cover um, if needed. Well, mm. yeah, you're quite right, Nikki. We did actually, um, instead of having everybody diving in past the ball, we did let the... Uh, the bigger ones do the grunt, and and uh, uh, Sloan and uh, Brad were often on the outside. All that, then oh, uh, Sloan cracked whereas... in a fair bit. <laughs> oh <laughs> God, did he, he what? Can't, he can't help himself. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> no. He sees, he yeah, sees ball, one... he goes ball. <laughs> he, he's like a little Jack Russell. He um, was, he was ball, meant re- he's really meant to be a bit on the outer, but as you say, he, he can't help himself. But um, I thought it, Brad, it, I think. It... I was just going to say, I think it actually took the umpires about three quarters to figure out he actually had a head. Yeah, no, um, I don't think they ever really worked that one out. No, I, well, they, they thought he had one once. Um, yeah, the the you know, less said about the umpiring, the better. Particularly number 10, I'm not sure how on earth he's managing to get um, games. Is that the dark that head does, I think so. He doesn't know how to make a decision. Um I thought, he, I, like I green, thought he actually green, green, green made a lot of can. decisions, uh, Nikki. They were just, just the wrong, wrong ones. <laughs> yeah, is um, that the one the umpire that gave the three frees in a row to Gold yeah. Coast just before half time, and then they <laughs> played on to advantage, so. picked the point, and then he gave him another kick. Yeah, that's right. Oh no, that was that, yeah. I'm which the players, the play, the is the players actually determined playing on? Which all our players are correct to going. He played on and missed. Yeah, but um, they didn't call. The, anyway, no, just back on. to Cam and right. Greenwood. The one thing they are so good at in those contested situations is getting the arms up and getting them clear. Whereas like Brad and Matt, their arms are down and they don't quite get them up as quick. Whereas for particularly for Greenwood, it's very the basketball-esque. He gets those arms up so fast that the tackle, they've already committed to the tackle around the body and they can't get his arms and that allows him time to dispose of it quite well. He didn't panic in the tackle either, Greenwood. Um, like you say, Nick, he gets his arms free and uh, he takes the body contact and he doesn't give it away. Um, you know, uh, just you know, to get rid of the ball. He actually is still looking to be creative. And there was once or twice I thought, "Geez, Huey, you, you get done a couple of times uh, holding the ball if you're not careful." But I guess you'd rather you'd rather hold the ball in and get done holding the ball than give give it away with an errant handball and and everyone get caught out of position. So uh, yeah, he, a, he's very good in break. close. Yeah, look, I I just want to point out one thing: has there ever been a game where two brothers have played and have had identical disposal stats? I saw that. I did. You're that. kidding? No, they were. It, they had the same number of kicks, same number of handballs. I think the total was thirty six each. Yeah, and, that's uh, right. Uh, it, it's. Uh, I think it might be a first feed. Yeah, well, certainly a first for the crow car, so we'll call it a first. <laughs> Let's go through some individual <laughs> stats, shall we? And uh, Matty and Brad Crouch, both thirty six touches, uh, thirteen kicks, twenty three handballs. That's incredible. Uh, Matty Crouch got involved a little bit more as the game wore on. Five marks. Um, Brad had six tackles, um, both had the usual numbers. Uh, Braddy Crouch uh, had some good clearance numbers there. Uh, I thought he well. was the most effective of the team. Yeah, and also 15 contested possessions to go along with 20 uncontested. The only knock was he was a bit wasteful by foot, Mac, uh, 61% disposal efficiency. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but four clearances, uh, four score involvements. Um, and I is I said to Cam on, on the Rev Up show, I said I'm quite happy for Brad just to work through this season and just build because Cam rightly pointed out, you know, he, we expect a lot from him and he hasn't played, he actually hasn't played a lot of games for the time that he's been around in the system. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to, to see Brad build, but I, I'd, I hope as time goes on, he continues to find a little bit more zip in his, in his movement and uh, he tidies up the disposal efficiency a bit. Yeah, but I think he's doing pretty good for a bloke who didn't play, you know, didn't play a whole no, year. Oh, that's what I mean. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. It's, you know, it's said in that context. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, but uh, overall, I, I think he's doing a little bit better than perhaps my expectations that he would do. I thought he might take a few games to really get into gear, but no, he's just hopped straight back where he left off. Um, Sloney with uh, far better num- numbers, Cameron, if you're listening. 17 and 15 for a total of 32 disposals, Cameron, if you're listening. Um, after his uh, quite average 8 and 8 last week, Cam is probably just throwing the, his phone through the window or something now. Uh, Had a good game, Sloney. Yeah, 7 marks, 6 tackles, uh, 5 inside 50s, 7 clearances, uh, 20 contested possessions, um, Slightly down on disposal efficiency, but that's because every disposal he gets is under so much pressure. Um, you know, 477 metres game, five score involvements. Um, that's, in anyone's books, that's probably a best on performance, don't you reckon? Yeah, well, look, I, I would be, I thought it was a toss up between him and Smithers in the sense of their impact on the game. Yeah. Uh, Smithers had a massive impact on the game with his rebounding from defence and really got a lot of our goals uh, by the, the run that he generated. Um, and Sloan, by uh, aggressively winning balls that you know he shouldn't have won and tackles that he applied them to prevent things. So they both had massive impacts on the game. And I think when you try to split players like that, you, it suddenly becomes a matter of opinion. So nobody's right and nobody's wrong. No, that's right. I, just said, I, I think I just think that Smithers, that first goal that he kicked, that was what broke. Um, pretty much the, broke the Suns, and it really gave that impetus to our guys. Um, I mean, it's, Sloney was just trying to be everywhere, and he was absolutely buggered by the last quarter. Um, the very start of the last quarter, he was trying to chase a player. He looked like he was running in treacle, but. Um, we know that that's what it's like. I I also think Cam had a really influential part to play in the game. To me, th- those are the top three. Um, and I don't think you could be wrong in probably picking any of those three. I'm actually going to make a controversial statement, Nikki, because um, you know I've been a little bit of a fan of his for quite a while, and I know Pete is as well. But can we stop the conversation now on Cam ellis Gelman Because... There's no doubt in my mind that he's best twenty two. There's no there's just no yeah. doubt in my mind. Absolutely. And he's he's not the quickest, although he's not slow. Um, but his strength in the contest and his ability to dish out his disposal is harshly dealt with by many on uh, internet forums and big footy and whatnot because I don't see him turn turn the ball over terribly much uh, today. Um, you know, he had 29 touches, three marks, eight tackles, four inside 50s, five clearances, 12 contested, went at 76% disposal efficiency, nine score involvements, 350 metres gain. Uh, you know, they're fantastic numbers. And this is from a yep. lad who's who's been on the pine for the last three weeks, apart from last week where he had a tag roll. He, he, he is, had ta- he had a tag roll in the first half and he was excellent. Yeah. He he is most definitely, most definitely him and Hugh Greenwood both. But I, the 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 chatter is always about Cam Ellis Yarman that oh he's not quite up to it. Blah 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 blah. He quite he quite clearly is, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. That's the end of the story. He quite yep. clearly is. Would you agree with that, Mac? Oh, it certainly is. <laughs> At the moment, it's 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 beyond the question. And but he's one of those players that uh, for some reason coaches always scrutinise and. If he drops off for one game, he often then gets kicked back down downstairs. But um, 
I, I'm with you. I think I think he's definitely proved that he's right up to it. And he was in our look. There were four good players today, and he was one of them. Yeah, like probably five were very good players. Well, you know, cast your mind. Yeah, cast your mind back to to Phil Walsh and Cam Ellis Yellman played every game under he Phil loves. Walsh. Yeah, and played yeah, very loved well. Cam. You know, and and that whole situation, I don't know touched everyone but uh it seemed to derail cam's career somewhat and then of course he had his acl um but let's not forget that he he was first choice midfielder um you know three four years ago in our team he he looks agile he looks extremely strong he's his his uh, work by hand is excellent his work by foot is underrated i don't think he turns the ball over terribly much at all he looked energetic, and I, I'd just like to end the conversation. He doesn't need to be talked about anymore. He's best 22 if fit he plays. Yeah, yeah. they've had a very good game today. Very yeah. good. Um, I agree with you on Smithers, too. 17 and 10 for 27, five marks, uh, two goals, one off halfback is excellent. Six inside 50s. Um, went at 85% disposal efficiency. The the stat that we all love from Brody is 674 metres gained. Um he had seven intercept possessions as well and eight score involvement. So uh, if not our best, then certainly in our top three. <laughs> yeah, it was a rip of a game, I thought. And, and for me, I was a little worried about Smithers. We were going to get another scared game for him because he did that kick out and it went straight to a Suns player. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, here we go. And then he avoided the kick outs again for the, the first quarter. But it, it was just something about the the run that he then started to provide and he had a shot on goal, it missed and then he had the other one and he nailed it and that was like, yep, floodgates open. I'm actually trusting those long kicks. Um, He did another beautiful one from out of the back lines across the space and I think it was to Gibbs. Yeah. Mm. Um, And it was just an, it's like, that's the Brody we've wanted to sleep. That's the laser. He's been, he's, been, he's been a little turtle for the past couple of weeks, stuck in his shell and does not want to come out. Um, we'll, we'll talk and, about that in but, a minute, Nick, um, that whole playing scared thing. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and it was just so nice to see that he didn't let that get to him. Look, other notable notables, as I mentioned uh, before, I thought uh, Atkins was all right, albeit a little bit wasteful at times, and tried to do a little bit much at times. But four thirty meters game from Rory was uh, respectable, um, and uh, yeah, despite the eight turnovers, uh, four score involvements, he did all right. And but it was one of those games, Macca for Rack, that uh, you know when it's being played on our turns, he loves getting on the end of it. Um, yeah, he does. He does. Uh, I hate to put I hate to put a downer on it, but Rory's challenge is to play effectively in high pressure games. And today, after quarter time, really, really wasn't a high pressure game. No, look, oh, you're quite right. And uh, if Atkins ever really wants to be judged at the level that he judges himself at, because um, uh, I think he has a fairly good opinion of himself, he's got to perform like that in the tough game yeah. against the much better quality because um, he does have a bit of a habit of sort of making a, a mockery of some of the more rabbit teams and uh, leerizing a little bit, but doing very well out of it. And, uh, yeah. I, I'd like just to see him be able to do that every week, you know, against the good teams as well. And he was, he was actually put in the middle um, in the last quarter, I, I think just because of once we lost Mer- Miller, who was supposed to be mm. half forward. Um, middle and so we act that's why we had to rest Cam and um, Greenwood and Sloan a bit more up forward than what we would have liked and of course that tied them out a little bit um, and, and he wasn't too bad I mean um, I said it in the chat but I actually saw him do a, a full-on like chest full body run at a bloke to hit him and it's like I'm not sure who this is but that's not the Atkins I know and he was doing that in the first quarter. So he obviously was one of those players who got a hell of a rocket. But it will be, will he do it again next week? Probably not. Well, and that's a, but, you know, and you're only as good as your last game. So at the moment, you know, he's done what's asked of him. But, yeah, I'm not going to be convinced until he plays like that in pressure games. Um, look, uh, others, uh, we've spoken about Huey. He did quite well. 18 touches, 15 contested. Um 
certainly not as damaging in terms of uh, territory as Cam Ice Yeoman, but uh, showed his value up forward. Don't don't you love it? You get Huey Greenwood up forward, you forget he's six four, six five, and can actually take a grab and uh, kick two goals one. Well, yeah, it's in- interesting is the contrast in these two goals as well. Uh, the first one was a very strong overhead mark uh, under pressure, and the second one was uh, a very very clever uh, left foot snap uh, on the wrong side for a left footer uh, in the forward pocket. So. Uh, uh, under again, you know, under a lot of pressure. So, uh, with a, a very quick brain, a very quick at getting the ball onto his boot, and uh, so the, yep. the contrast between the two goals just shows how good this guy uh, can be when he's at his best. He should have had three goals because he hit the post with the other one. That was a beautiful um, piece of play from him. Um, it's like don't aim at the big stick. Um, what I, I was, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm sitting here with a smile on my face because what, what have I been calling for for the past three three weeks, Pete? Greenwood up forward. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Greenwood up forward because, as I said, he can take a contested mark. Yep. Oh, look, didn't our forward line look different with a couple of blokes up there that could take a bloody grab? Jesus. Oh, no, no. I, there was one series of play. It was quite funny that it was had Himmelberg, um, Ellis Yolman, Murphy and Greenwood involved. And we're going, oh, look, it's our SNFL forward line. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Down the other thing. end, though, uh, talk, uh, talking about over in uh, Mark, I, mean, um, I thought Alex Keith uh, played a very good game yeah. with, uh, with his intercept marking and et cetera. Yeah, very solid. Um, uh, Mackie, you're right, took the six marks to go along with 18 touches. Um and just he's he's not Tom Duday, and he never will be Tom Duday. But I think he's filling that role uh, quite adequately at the moment. Um, there's going to be times where he's going to be more uh, required to be more accountable. But he had uh, 12 intercept possessions today, which is all you can really ask of the bloke playing in that in that position. Uh, I was actually quite worried that we were going to be top heavy down back. Um, because they they don't have a huge amount of tools. And but as it turns out, Peter Wright um, did get the better of us uh, as the game wore on up forward. But, um, yeah, I thought Keith was excellent. Uh, I thought Talia looked a little bit freer, um, also took eight marks um, and had uh, four intercept possessions. Uh, uh, Kyle Hardigan probably didn't need to be there. I, I, I do feel as if we went in one tall too many down back um and when miller went off oh geez are we, are we you know it's probably a good thing that we're so far in front at that stage already it really didn't make much difference but i think they're going to have to have a look at whether they keep kyle in the, in the team when we're playing op- opposition that have that sort of forward structure because i think he was a bit mm. superfluous today i i i actually like the way our defense did structure up against them and i thought that the who we had on and who we then had them on um, meant that we had actually looked at their strengths um, and were matching up against the defence instead of just trusting this is our shape and this is what we stick to no matter who goes into those positions. I don't agree um, with you on that one, Nick. If, the, if their forward they, they, line had got more service from their midfielder, uh, from their midfielders, it might have been a different story. Um I just don't think they, they got were, enough service. That's because they pushed. They they had to flood, so they were pushing up so high, and we maintained our defense structure, and we made sure that um, we would actually swap and move as to who was the loose man. Sometimes we actually had two loose players, um, and they would actually kind of swap depending on where their opponents were upfield, um, and. I actually thought it worked a lot better See, the way Gold um, than Coast what we have, been, have seen. The way Gold Coast have been playing is just that whole work rate situation where they push numbers back and then they work really hard through the corridor, force turnovers, etc. And then they get once they get the ball forward, they re- rely on repeat entries. So, you know, because uh, they haven't got standout targets, so they'll push the ball forward and, the, and then they'll push up again. Um, but what they weren't able to do with us is actually maintain any sort of territory in their forward 50 and I think that's where their forward struggled um <clears throat> pardon me I think I'm coming down with cold um but um 
that being said, if they'd have got, if they'd have been able to have the ball forward more often, I, I think we might have struggled with Kyle there. But anyway, I, I don't know whether it's right to have Talia Hardigan and Keith in the same team. Um, I guess it depends. Now, on I'm actually in the same camp as you, Fiend, on this one because um, if anybody were to go out of that structure, it would be Hardigan because he's, well, I think nobody uh, ever doubts. His endeavour. No, he's just out. He's uh, he terribly can, out of form, Mac, at the moment. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, that that, that spoil where he he gave the free away. Yeah. Um, I couldn't work out why the hell he had to not only try to spoil the ball, but but then smash the arm down over the shoulder to make sure that umpire could see the free. Um, well, I couldn't think that was overly bright. Yeah. Well, but, at the in the end of the day, he just he didn't have the reach because that that um, was against but, two uh, meter Peter, I think. Yeah. No. Look, if, if and I, I wouldn't mind seeing it, um, perhaps even young Shoal getting a game as well. Yeah, well, that's kind of what I was leading to. Shoal had another 20-odd touches on the weekend uh, playing through the midfield, I think. Um, yep, he was. Yeah. I, I'd love to see Shoal come in, particularly now that we've got Miller right down. Um, you know, I, I don't think um, we've got any other players due to come back um, yet. And it might be time for a McHenry or a, or a Shoal uh, to come in, obviously Chase Jones might be available. Well, will be available next week, so he's he'll be up for consideration. It'll be interesting to see what they do because I wouldn't mind betting they actually start pushing Bryce behind the ball a little bit more. Um, and yeah, maybe leave him even... there because Miller was never in the back lines in this game for mm. the small part that he played. He was midfield or half forward. Mm. So he was um... not in the back lines at all. Now, yeah. I have a sort of answer for you about your question earlier about the Crouch Brothers. Yeah. Um, so I asked this one thing on Twitter. Yeah. As to whether there's been a game where two brothers are the same game, exactly the same disposal amounts apart from today. Apparently it has happened 355 times, but it's the same number of disposals, he said. But the 36 by uh, Brad and Matt it's, is a new record going past the 32 um, that was previously held by um, Chad and Kane. We've since uh, there's myself and somebody else has since done a follow up going. No, no, no. We're actually after the same amount of kicks, handballs, exactly. disposals. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, uh, if anybody knows, it's going to be him, and I'll keep an eye on Twitter. Yeah, you think okay. the Cracker Boys okay. might have had the same disposals a few times, but uh, I've never seen kick and handball the same. Anyway. Well, so, you know, uh, the new lad, Elliot Hemmelberg, I thought he was uh, a revelation. Uh, he didn't get huge huge stats, but I loved the way he presented. I loved his work at ground level. Uh, I think he performed adequately in the ruck. Got a half a dozen odd hit outs. Um, and his, a... his follow-up in the ruck was yeah. what I was pleased with. Yeah. We, know, we know he's competitive and he's got a good burst of speed on him. Yeah, and that said, that said, I didn't think Riley O'Brien had a bad game either. There was a big question mark about whether he was going to be able to deal with Wits. Wits is a, a pretty solid ruckman, um, but Wits was pretty much useless. I mean, even the taps that Wits got, he wasn't really getting, you know, that much traction out of him. Yes, they won the centre clearances reasonably comfortably in the end, but I actually thought Riley O'Brien did much better around the ground. Uh, this week, he got involved. He linked up a little bit, took a couple of marks. Uh, it was excellent. Lovely below his pass knees. for the Berg. Yeah, so um, you know, a bit. No, I thought it was a much of an improved game from him. The only yeah. thing is that you know the old the old uh, story of never give the ball to a ruckman because the thought process of a ruckman. Is yeah, but that's not his. Fault. That's not his fault. He's, he's yeah, actually pretty. Contested possessions. He's pretty good though. Thirteen contested possessions. That's not bad for no, the no, right he did, no, he did a good job. I'm not, not, I'm not knocking him, but uh, I remember you are not, you are knocking him, and you know why? Because you're one of those shitty little fool, is like small rover bastards, <laughs> <laughs> and you just make fun of the ruckman all the time. Get stuff, get stuff, <laughs> Maka. Uh, well. Get it put down no, your bloody no. throat all day. Uh, well, I, I just want to say, <laughs> I want to say, poor bloody Rob though. Um, last week where he was absolutely hammered for, you know, the blocking and, and the pushing under the ball, all those frees that he was <laughs> giving yeah. away, they were happening to him. You're not asking and for consistency, were you? Perfect, perfectly fine. Oh, yeah, that was never going to happen. I, I'm just, <laughs> I'm not, I was just feeling for the poor bloke going, <laughs> he can't win. 
And there was an there was one stage where the centre ruck where Wits actually pushed him out, took the ball out of the ruck and went to play on. The umpire blows his whistle and plays a blocking. And we're like, oh, great. No, he gave the blocking free to Wits, who pushed Rob under yeah, the ball. Yeah, I know. That was weird. Him out and took yeah, it. That it was like, Absolutely. dude, do you actually know how to football? No, I don't think so. Now, look, it was Eddie Betts' 300th game and I thought he, he, he played pretty well. Uh what do you have, like 14 touches, uh, kicked six goals, three, if you don't mind. One was um, Murphy's goal. Well, yeah, so, you know, but still. But to be able to keep that goal on in your 300th. <laughs> that, that, was I mean, yeah. that was that was. I was sitting on the couch watching it uh, with my partner and um, like, it was just ridiculous. It, it was just ridiculous the way it all felt. Like it, it came off, I think it was Harbrow that was with him on it. Uh, it came off the Gold Coast Suns' arm and then uh, Eddie's, it's just bounced straight, straight in his lap. And, but to kick a left foot checky on the wrong, on the like sort of falling the wrong away, side. that's uh, no mean feat. And he made it look easy. And for that to happen on his 300th, it just epitomised his whole career. And uh, we've just been privileged to have that guy run around on our team for a while. It's a pleasure to watch, a, an absolute pleasure to watch it. Um, I've never had the privilege of meeting him off the field, but they say he's a, a pleasure to meet off the ground as well. And, uh, uh, yeah, where's your Sophie? We're very, very fortunate to have such a quality individual and such a quality player in our team. And, uh, and I thought it was absolutely magic that he had to keep one yeah. of the candidates the goal of the year yeah. with, the, with the, his last goal of the game. So, yeah, yeah well done, Eddie. And, now, you know, P- thank P- you very P- much for the pleasure you give us. PJ Crows has a quote in the chat from earlier, which is apparently an Eddie quote. And he said, I had a bet with my brother-in-law, Tom. If I kick five goals, he has to get a tattoo of my face on his butt. <laughs> is that why he was going five for? <laughs> he did say that. Yeah. He did yeah. say that. <laughs> so bend over, Tom. That's pretty funny. Um, yeah, so look. Uh, just wonderful from Eddie um, uh, and really good and really good to see him sort of up and about too and enjoying his footy and uh, he, he was looking dangerous and he's still not quite there and I think I think actually Eddie could benefit from having another uh, small forward around but I, I will say that Lockie Murphy came out playing like a bloke who was playing for his career um, he just was ferocious in terms of his defensive pressure. He messed up a few times uh, going the other way, but I thought his endeavour was fantastic. And as he settled as the game went on, I thought he was uh, uh, very serviceable. And to get three goals out of Lockie Murphy, that's exactly what we want from our defensive small forward, don't you think? I think he played an excellent game for uh, uh, as, uh, playing as the small up forward. Um, and he's virtually most games he's playing for his career in the sense of being in the side uh, because if you look at marginal players he's often be regarded as one but on his game today he's going to be there next week no doubt about that 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 was a terrific game I thought um, he he took you know he went in with Angel Fear Crinian he's got a small body and he and he takes the blows and um, he certainly uh, Atkins can learn a little bit about courage from him. Um, and uh, I was very, very impressed with his game and uh, very pleased with his game. I thought he, he certainly sewed up his spot for next week or two anyhow. Yeah, I, I'm a fan of Murph, but I reckon I reckon we're asking a lot of a bloke who's playing, you know, it's like playing half forward or, or forward pocket, you know. You, you're charged with uh, getting your own ball and making your own opportunities and we expect him to hit the scoreboard, we expect him to provide defensive pressure, etc., etc., and you know, so it's not an easy role to play. And I thought he did it really hard well. Role. Yeah, I thought he did it really hard well. Hard role. Well, Riley Knight, what did you think of his game? Uh, well, he had eight and ten, and I reckon I say Riley Knight gets eight and ten every week. <laughs> his, his first, yeah, it was kind of funny because his first quarter was really good. Um, I thought he was quite up and about, um, but then once we got the run on, he drops off. So when we need the, that player to be a lot more proactive, et cetera, and, and to get us through the congestion, he's really good at that, mm. but he needs to be more offensive. Yeah, I just like him to raise his game just up to the next level because, like you said, Nicky, he was up and about early and 
then just sort of faded a little bit after that. Yeah, I. Because it just. I think he's really it's won the a, marginal place. Yeah, it's always about output for Riley with me, and I, like I said the other day, I love what he does. I just wish he'd do a little bit more of it. Um, yeah. But again, it's a bit the same as Murphy. We're asking quite a lot out of him. The, the position that he's playing, we're actually expecting quite a bit out of him. So, you know, I guess not everyone can have, you know, 15 and 8 like David McKay. Um, so, you know, but, it, it, you know, I, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Play on. <laughs> um, I've got an answer for you, Fiend. Yes. So out of the 355 times where two brothers have mm. um, had the same amount of disposals, only 25 times have they had the exact number there you go. of kicks handballs. So that works out to 7%. There so it go. is actually pretty rare. And then if you factor in the uh, telling stat of goal assists, which Brad Did they and do Matt the same both, as had, as well? both had one. <laughs> and, oh, one. And, and neither of them had a mark inside 50 or a bounce. So that means that this must be a unique stat. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right, well, look, just to sum it up, I, I, I felt like we played well. The other thing that I just wanted to briefly touch on before we wind it up is uh, the coaching box dynamic. Don Pike spending a lot of time on the bench this week. Um, some would say to connect to the players, but Macker, I don't know. Do you reckon he might have just wanted to get the hell out of the coaches' box because there's a lot of stupid <laughs> ideas in there lately? Yeah, oh, there were some comments in the chat about escaping somebody, some certain <laughs> dickhead up there. <laughs> Sorry, I can't, see, I can't see the chat today, so... No. Um, for me, no, they, might, I, they might be right. <laughs> I think part, part of what it was was because we had a first quarter with no goals. So that meant there were no runners on the, the ground. So you can't send your runner out to do that message. So I think him actually coming down to talk directly to the players and, and actually using the players as the runner was probably a smart idea. Yeah. But, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I like know, the idea. <laughs> I'm liking the idea of the, of the uh, coach uh, sitting on the bench and uh, it is being used a lot more widely uh, week by week, I think, because with no runners, uh, it's a lot harder for the coach to communicate his thoughts, his thoughts to the players. Yeah. Uh, not the line coach's thoughts, but his own thoughts. And sitting on the bench there, he, when they say come off and they rotate, he's got the opportunity to actually get his message across. And I think... Uh, He's got all. He's got everybody upstairs uh, sitting there, uh, getting the bird's eye view of the overall play and the, the passages of play and how everybody's structured, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but he's talking to them about what he wants them to do individually, and uh, I, I, yeah, I'm starting to really like it, and I think it's uh, good to see that Don's joined the uh, coaches that are starting to do that. I still just reckon he wanted to get away from bloody. <laughs> Some idiot pissing in his ear that we have to start chipping it because we're moving the ball too fast. Shut up, Camberho. We can move the ball fast. I'm getting out of here. That's what he said. Probably anyway. Not. <laughs> All right. Well, look, I reckon that pretty much uh, does us for tonight. Um, it's uh, getting on for 9.30, obviously, later. Uh, thanks, everyone, for staying up and listening to us. Uh, if you're listening on demand, don't forget you can follow us on Twitter, AFL Crowcast, or like us on Facebook, AFL Crowcast. If you're listening via iTunes, please send us a, uh, or drop us a review or a star rating. That'd be great. Uh, if you want to join the throngs of people that are becoming patrons and supporting us uh, on Patreon, <laughs> please go to patreon.com forward slash AFL Crowcast. Or you can just go to our website, aflcrowcast.com, and click on the Patreon button. Don't forget also, just mentioning the website, we had a couple of listeners over the last week or so uh, get fired up sufficiently enough to want to put their uh, words down on, on uh, in print. And uh, you can always sign up on our website. Uh, it's an easy registration. And uh, that gives you the ability to post articles uh, on our fan say section of our website. We'd love to have any of you guys that want to uh, put some words down or have a bit of a rant or put your opinion across. Feel free to register on the website at a4crowcast.com. 
and uh, you can write up an article there and as long as it's not filled with uh, expletives, uh, it'll, it'll be up there for the world to see. <laughs> I know I'm allowed to put expletives in my articles. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Look, I reckon that just that's about does us. That's what happens when you're the editor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right. <laughs> Thanks very much, Nikki and Maka, for joining us tonight. Sorry to keep you waiting while I had a little snooze on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Gave me time to get my cup of tea <laughs> so I can actually last through the cast. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and we'll see you on Tuesday night for Tuesday Night Live. See you guys. Bye, Bye all. All.